of uh, of articles or things that I like this and I you know post on the blog. Yeah. I'm raising it. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Right. All the quantum papers, the thing, the right? idea. Yeah. Just you do it, everything. Yeah. Well, you're going to, if you come, if you keep coming, you're going to learn more. But yes, I think there's, this is our 50th year. And so I think part of the 50th year. You know, but. <laughs> yes. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and, yeah, let's go ahead and, you want to sit down? So I think I'm all, am I all, I'm already on? Yeah, I'm on. He was turning you down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, you, you need a microphone. <laughs> uh, okay. You have your attention. All right. Uh, yes. I'd like to thank uh, the, the Theories Lunch Community and the Simons Institute for letting us uh, take over their lunch. Uh, this is something, a special event that nobody else can do. <laughs> uh, we've, we're going to have, starting this week and for the next six weeks, we're going to have Turing laureates who did their research at Berkeley and, and went on to great things. And I thought it'd be fun, um, not only for the lectures this afternoon, but to kind of get to know them. And so I think the model is, we'll see how this works. This is the first time. But I'm, I'm going to ask some questions to both Shafi and Silvio. And then, uh, and then after a while, we'll open it up and or I'll, uh, I'll repeat the questions so the people recording can do it. So I'm going to start with Shafi because she gave the talk last week. So you were born in New York City. I was. And uh, so you're, you're a Native American. <laughs> and, and then your family moved to Israel. Why? So it's actually the other way around. So my uh, parents are Israelis. So actually, my father came to Israel uh, after the war, after World War II, which in Israel we call the war. And, uh, and my mother's an Israeli native. And I was actually born in New York because they happened to be here for a few years. But I, I, I was an Israeli, really. I grew up in Israel. Um, so coming, um, when, going to Israel was a natural thing. That's where our home was. And coming back here was the kind of going elsewhere. And so you went to high school in Israel. Did you, were anything special? Were you on do sports or the chess team or math, math Olympiad or anything like that? You know, this whole idea of teams, it's, uh, <laughs> I must say it's very American, but maybe in Israel they do that now too. But it, when I was growing up, there was no chess team or uh, sports for that matter. In fact, sports, really, the main thing I remember about sports is that when we had to run around the school, I would cut through. All of us did. Um, so we would find creative ways to do less. Shortest but distance. Exactly, exactly. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, uh, I was good at certain things. You were good at math. I was good at math. I was good at physics, and uh, I was actually good at literature. I wanted to be a writer. You wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write. So if it was, when you were young, they'd ask you what you want to do, and you wanted to write. I wanted to write novels, yeah. Uh -huh. But you know, these Israel Israelis of that period, and I think it's still true, are very pra very pragmatic people. So writing, that's very nice. You can do it as a hobby. But really, you know, if you are... If you, you want to be a doctor. If you can, <laughs> I don't know a doctor, doctor, scientist, engineer, something pragmatic, something you can uh, chew. chew? That's not an English expression, but something you can eat. <laughs> so you can eat. So do, do, you, do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have a brother and a sister. So, uh, what, what, so what's their education? What? Um, they're, they, all, they have MBAs, actually, both my brother and my sister, and I'm the middle child. They, yeah. They're in finance. They're in finance. Uh, uh. Uh, so I must make your parents very happy. <laughs> I don't know what, the, uh, what their state is right now because they're not alive anymore. But it did make them very happy. <laughs> so th how about your parents' education? Did, did they? So again, you know, the war is kind of a determining factor there. So my father was uh, studying law, but then the war broke out, so he never really finished. But he was, uh, you know, very educated, very sort of grandiose, but he didn't have formal uh, education. My mother actually, um, she went to school of agriculture, and then she got married, and she didn't actually finish. Okay, uh, let me ask Silvio. So you were born in Palermo. Confirmed. You're, you're Sicilian. Yes. And uh, so how about you in high school? Were there any 
special indicators of your brilliant feature? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. If anything, maybe I was a, a late bloomer. So uh, <laughs> I went to a classical high school. And I remember, uh, um, so um, uh, my, I come from a family of jurists. I am the one who got away. And uh, so, you know, I started with this uh, classic high school, you know, Greek philosophy, history, Latin, whatever, uh, uh, arts, uh, etc. And, uh, but in between all this, there was, you know, some math, very little, but it was a Euclidean geometry, most probably because it was Greek, okay? But that was enough to hook me <laughs> in. And I remember that uh, uh, even though it was uh, just in the first year, right, of this uh, classic education, at the end, I says what impressed me the most was actually this notion that the truth could be actually deduced. And to me, that was uh, some sort of magic. And so without uh, not knowing uh, whatever, I decided to go into physics. It was a short, uh, uh, short um, lived love because uh, uh, at the time uh, we were doing uh, a semester first of uh, math and then a semester of physics. And after I was exposed to the calculus, forget physics. <laughs> <laughs> Never kicked in. So I decided this to... This was in college. This was in college, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I went there for on the... On the um, so on the, on the push of this, you know, <laughs> um, 14, 15, 15, I was 15 when I was exposed to Euclidean geometry and then math disappeared from the curriculum. And I somehow re-emerged with a college with a desire to do math. So then, and Shafi, you went, to, you went to America, you went to CMU for a year. I did. Was that a hard decision? Um, no, everything somehow in my life is always kind of serendipitous. My brother was, went there to get a, an MBA and I had time sort of uh, after I finished high school, was in, I had some like a year and a half or something and, uh, which were, were in schedule. So I went to visit him and he had these math professors and uh, he said his sister came, sister is here, she wants to take some classes and they asked him, is she good in math? And he said, yeah, she's pretty good. I said, okay, why don't she enroll? So I never did any SATs, no applications <laughs> and that's it. That's how I went to be in a CMU uh, applied math and then I went into computer science. And then, uh, so you applied for graduate school. Uh, wh where did you get in? I got in at CMU and at Berkeley. How did you do I got rejected everywhere else. They rejected everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> To, to our great fortune. So how did you decide to come to <laughs> it's Berkeley? It's true. Uh, to my great fortune. How did I decide to go to Berkeley? <laughs> so I don't know if you know this story, but I was, uh, I actually told at CMU that I was coming, but in my tra tradition, uh, I never told any Berkeley that I wasn't coming. And uh, I, had a, uh, I had an internship at RAND in Santa Monica. And one day, me and a friend of mine from CMU, who also had an internship there, we decided to drive up. Uh, to San Francisco and we drove it and we came into Berkeley and I remember this glorious blue skies in the green hills in the background we see the Campanile and it was like wow it was like <laughs> falling in love and it was uh, it was like uh, and then I let Berkeley know that I was going to come to Berkeley <laughs> <laughs> it's true and I told Carter and Gimel that I'm not coming <laughs> Uh, how, how about you, Silvio? Did you get, did you get into multiple graduate schools or? <laughs> well, uh, let's say I n I was never much of a bureaucrat. I don't know how these <laughs> yes. things are done. So I, I applied I still, to I, only one school. I, I, I still remember that he's not much of a bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I applied uh, only to Berkeley. My good fortune was that it was uh, accepted, and, and I came. Yeah. So and why why did Berkeley call to you? Why did why was that the one school you applied to? Well, you know, you must uh, know that uh, you have an aura, right? And uh, and uh, at, uh, at that time, uh, the aura was uh, um, uh, the wind came from physics, and there was you know the Berkeley School of Physics and things that everybody knew. And uh, the Campanile was already iconographic thing, you know. It was a really. So we had an Italian. We had yeah, yes, Italian. yes, 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 <laughs> and. Uh, and so um, I think of it was, um, I was told of it um, and, um, about Manuel um, Blum who was uh, um, uh, teaching there and I really felt it was a, uh, a great idea to apply. What the hell I know that you know, I should have you know, applied to many, to many places, right? And, um, you know, uh, luck uh, is a part of our business, yeah. So Shafi, when you came here, you, had, you didn't know what you were gonna study, right? You, you, you were open. Yeah, I had no idea. No, in fact, uh, I think that uh, I thought I was going to do AI. 
uh, at the time. Well, like came, 80% of everybody who applies. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's today. I don't think that was the case then. I mean, I came from Carnegie Mellon, you know, I took a course with Raj Reddy. A, I remember that course, you know, it was uh, in, uh, this idea. I did this project that generated poetry or something of that sort. Uh, so that's what I thought I would do. And so I came here and then I started taking classes and I did actually a master's, not in theory. With, right. um, with David. I, I, I might have been her first boss. <laughs> I employed her at, uh, as a first year student, as I recall. Right. Uh, but apparently my research wasn't very important, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, you, actually, it was important and interesting, too. But then I met all the theory students, and right. they were so much fun. And, uh, <laughs> and then I started talking to Manuel, and, it, and uh, I started working with Manuel. And, and that was your first, in your second year? That was my second year. Second year. Yeah. Do you remember meeting Shafi? Absolutely. You want to have a full story? I'll tell you the full story. So, sure. um, I, um, so at, at that point, you know, I started studying, uh, scouting around what Berkeley was about, and uh, and um, I took, you know, um, a course in graph algorithm from Shimon Even at a summer school somewhere, um, and so I knew about uh, Dick Carp, and so uh, and Dick was uh, going to teach a course on algorithms. And so, and uh, my English was extremely poor at the time, but you can imagine you can f back forward right, <laughs> and see what it was. I couldn't understand anything. So I decided to say, how do I, where do I sit in the class? You know, in first row, heaven forbid, they can ask a question. I knew nothing about you know, theoretical computer science. I was doing only something, uh, some, maybe some logic and some calculus. So that's all I had. And so it says, you know, in the back, maybe my English is, 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 is I would not pick it up. Second row is too iffy. Third row seems right, so I sit in, in the third row. And I was not accustomed to the undifferential treatment, let's put it this way, that the students give, you know, American uh, academics. <laughs> and so I see that people were eating lunch, I said, oh my God, I was looking around, uh, I was seeing that the jaws would drop, not everybody was comfortable. And uh, somebody was more comfortable than others, who was sitting like this in the front row, they go, wow, that's impressive. And pretty soon they started doing like this, <laughs> that's more impressive. <laughs> pretty soon it was done like this, and pretty soon with the, 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 the hands, you know, hanging off, it says, wow, Asleep, and says all of a sudden I really Dick finishes the lecture, and assuming and left the room. So I popped in and I look who the, the hell might have been, and it was Shafi. <laughs> <laughs> First the meeting, you know, it was made a, made an impression on me. Well, I don't remember this, but I was asleep. So. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so you you both were in the theory group, both. With Manuel Blum as your advisor, who is coming here in two weeks, uh, and, and we'll be able to ask him <laughs> these questions. That, so you started working together pretty, or pretty soon after that. Is that right, or not? Uh, I guess so. We took a course from Gene Lawler at the time. Gene Lawler was here. He's he's not here anymore. He's uh, passed away many years ago uh, on scheduling, and I think we had, did a project on uh, also with VJ maybe. Uh, a, 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 a project in the course. A project in the course. But they didn't really go anywhere, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But in any case, uh, the fact that we showed up late it means the scheduling was not in our <laughs> genes. <laughs> Good point. No, I, I, there was a course that Manuel Blum taught actually on uh, computational number theory, uh, algorithms for number theory problems, and uh, we both were in the class in, as all the other theory students were. And I found this class extremely exciting and the problems. And then we start working on a specific problem. And then, uh, you know, the thing that led, just, I still remember how hard it was to pick a dissertation topic. So to make you all feel good, they, their tour, they, the topic they worked on together while they're grad students led to a touring award. So no pressure on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, how did that come about? How did you end up working on uh, the security stuff? Well, he, somehow uh, everything is about you know, luck, right? And so, um, and uh, I believe, uh, by the way, that uh, the motivating things in science are uh, examples. Okay, never mind like, the grandiose theories. The theories come later. You have to explain the examples, okay? And so, and um, so, Manuel um, mentioned you know mental poker, and uh, not knowing any better, to say, well. 
that's what we should do. You know, it turns out that uh, we were eventually able, 10 years later, to have a, a full solution to this. <laughs> but uh, we felt, as I said, what's a great idea? So let's solve it tomorrow. So we started doing this, and pretty soon it became clear that the first thing you do, you need to encrypt the cards correctly, right? And when you encrypt the cards, now you have a problem that the cards, there is only 52 of them in poker. And so sometimes when you want to hide a message, if you think about uh, deterministic encryption, if the message has a lot of natural entropy, it's very hard to guess what it means and check whether it's a bit encrypted correctly, right? In the 52 cards, you can just cycle through. So we figure out that to solve this problem, we need to have stage one, which was a, a way to, to somehow encrypt the cards. And so then all of a sudden we realized the problem was a bit harder. And so uh, we start talking about this probabilistic encryption. We start talking about the definitions of security for these encryptions and so on and so forth. And uh, I think uh, at the end uh, we postponed the solution for uh, mental poker. <laughs> we focused on, on the basic uh, part of encryption. That's how we started. So just to add, my mem um, when Manuel the whole class was about number theory, so it was something that w had nothing to do with cryptography, but in the last lecture he talked about some applications of number theory cri to cryptography, and one of them was this mental poker protocol, and then he mentioned one more paper by Lipton, which showed that there was a sort of a bug, and the bug was unclear uh, because the problem was never defined really, so it wasn't really a bug. It's only when you define something that you can talk about you know, not obeying the definition. But people have a sort of a generic, vague idea of what it means to play poker, there are cards, you deal them, but the bug that he found was that uh, you could leak some partial information. So by looking at an encryption of a card, you could tell maybe whether it was a high or low card. Uh, and that actually is very meaningful for poker, right? So it was the question was to understand that and then to say, okay, how can you encrypt where no partial information can leak? And uh, then you had to define sort of encryption as something that doesn't leak partial information. And then there was a more general definition than that, and then find a way to do that. And it turned out that that uh, amounted to uh, encrypting a single bit. How do you encrypt a zero or a one? And when you can do that, you could actually show that you could encrypt things more generally that hide all uh, partial information. And um, this encrypting of a single bit was really a very crucial uh, departure from what people were doing in cryptography before. Because rather than taking some message and transforming it to an encrypted message, you know, you th we thought about this idea of uh, a, deci a hard decision problem, like a yes-no question, and having uh, the answer yes correspond to encrypting a zero, and the answer no correspond to encrypting a one. So now encryptions were instances of a hard problem, where if the solution was yes, that means you're encrypting a zero, if the solution was one, you're encrypting a one. And that was really conceptually something very different than people thought of before because you could talk about now about having a, a decision problem which was really hard on the average. You couldn't do it better than 50-50. And that was crucial for encrypting a bit extremely well where you couldn't tell it better than 50-50. And from there on it went on, but as Silvio said, the paper name that appeared was how to uh, probabilistic encryption and how to play mental poker. Because it seems like, you know, it's like saying some, like world peace, no, I don't know, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, and uh, no bullying or something <laughs> in high school. So it doesn't seem to be on the same level, but to us, uh, it started from the second rather than the first. Well, you know, uh, just to insist uh, um, on, on this um, theme. So we took this uh, computational number theory class, right? So we had to explain uh, primes, the defi definition of the prime number theorem, uh, blah, 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 blah. How many computational number problems you think you can fit in a class? Any idea? Seven, nine, okay. That was our greatest luck because one of the nine, we could actually use it for our own purposes. Because sometimes knowing less is to know more. <laughs> and so, you know, because otherwise, if you pick the typical um, encyclopedia of a number theory, there is so many things. Heaven knows before even you hit something which has uh, the characteristics that you want. But, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, to know very little is um, is actually uh, very good. Can I just say one thing? I know that we're, we're but uh, uh, with all the fact that we talk about serendipity and luck, it's not just luck and serendipity. So one other issue here is that somebody's presenting a solution. Let's say it was my mental poker. Maybe it's not such an interesting problem, or it is an interesting problem, but not a fundamental problem. But I think it's, uh, the idea is not to really take what people present to you uh, of, on faith value. So, so there's a solution. Okay, then now next, you know, solve another problem. If you understand it, 
often you could see that it doesn't actually fulfill all the requirements. So there are some other, you know, you really fully understand it. What are they delivering? What are they not delivering? Sometimes if you are at the end of the chain, you, they are delivering the full solution and you like the definition. It's, it's all encompassing. But it's rarely the case when a paper just comes out, especially when an area starts. So I think that's very important to know. I know there's a lot of new areas on the horizon these days. I'm 100% sure that people don't have the right definitions. They, uh, they maybe they have the question, but they don't know really what they're asking. And even when they deliver the solution, it doesn't satisfy at all. And if you really truly believe that, but you think somebody has an interesting idea, I would sort of dig and dig and try to understand it and, and go from there. Because it gives you a starting point, but it's I, rarely the ending point. Yeah. So, so at the time, so you got the paper on probabilistic uh, security and it was accepted. Did, did you realize how significant it was at the time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Shafi, Shafi, not so much? Okay. It's I so, liked it. You, you, you thought you liked the result. I liked the result. You have to, actually, if you hold the microphone. I liked it, but to realize how significant it was, no. But you thought it was a game changer. Yes. So what, <laughs> one good thing of coming, you know, from a, a classical thing is that at least you have a good sense of whatever is going to stick in the long term. And, uh, and so I thought that that was uh, the beginning of, uh, of a very serious um, uh, notion about uh, information uh, and uh, hiding and things. And I really felt uh, it was, uh, um, and, and, uh, and computation that was uh, at all the elements to, to continue um, working on it. So, yeah. Uh, so the, the kind of, this, uh, this series all got started because my friend John Osterhout, uh, I, Contrary to the rules, I'm, the day before the Turing announcement, I went and told him, I, 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 I said I wanted to tell him something. And, and I told him I was getting the Turing Award tomorrow, and he said, well, good, because either you were getting the Turing Award or you had cancer. Is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> but then he made this remarkable observation, is that, because there's all kinds of statistics about it's Turing Awards. It's sort of a terminal thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's a terminal award. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and he said, you know, like, where Turing Award winners visited or where they did their undergraduate school. But he said the really thing that matters is where the research was done. That's the right test, right? And so that observation led to how are we going to let people, you know, what should we do about that in the series? So why, you know, four of the seven projects are in theory. So do you have any idea why Berkeley is so good in theory? Do you have any, <laughs> you know, what, you know, or was so good <laughs> in, the 70s, in the 70s and 80s? Well, I can tell you at the t first of all, I think it is so good, but a, a, <laughs> but uh, I can tell you uh, at the time, I think it's all about the, the talent that, that is drawn here, right? And especially in theory, so it's, we're not talking about resources, uh, but we're talking about quality of people. <laughs> and, uh, and also I think the theory fundamentally is about ideas rather than execution, right? Uh, I mean, later they will make an impact and it'll be, and, and there is to me something about the fact that the atmosphere here is fairly, open and there's time in between and even when you walk from one building to the next you see the blue skies and you walk a lot outside mm. but no seriously there's time for the mind to ruminate and i think that ideas maybe sort of Id ideas that are not uh, that are sort of original uh it's very important for them to have something about the atmosphere some ch some chemistry uh, which uh which is conducive so i I would disagree. I don't want to take uh, away anything from uh, Berkeley theory, but it's not only about theory. It's about Berkeley more than theory. So and um, and so why Berkeley? So when you have to explain uh, in stages, and uh, because I really believe in critical mass. Okay. So anytime that there is an atomic uh, explosion, so to speak, or any, so you need the first a critical mass. And so for doing critical mass, you must be in an in, in innovative field. You must have the time to think. So I'm really a big believer, by the way, of uh, even the big institutions. Because when you are in a specialized, very high level um, university, um, you are actually on a channel. If you are uh, masked by a lot of people, if you don't do anything, nobody knows. And that is the important thing, because if you want to explore something, you should not have the pressure to have what is the result tomorrow. And so, and then you, the fact of it, uh, so that is, uh, you have the numbers. Second of all, you have the talent. Second of all, you have the culture. So we had, um, um, essentially, it's about interaction and how easy it was uh, to, to interact. Um, uh, so with the faculty, but in particular actually among the students, because the truth of the matter is that you learn from each other 
as much as, in fact, more that you can learn from uh, from the from the faculty. And to me, that was uh, there was actually a nurturing uh, part of of the students that uh, would welcome us and uh, somehow accompany us. I was. Uh, um, I was coming from a, a different field and he never had expertise. I remember David Lichtenstein was a student over here. He was finishing his PhD and he thought about uh, taking me under his wing and tried to say, why don't you try to solve a problem, right? He says, you're struggling, you know, um, too much, you know, with uh, undergraduate courses. Solve a problem. And so he's, he's giving me some instructions of what problems I, I, could, I could work and solve. So. These are the type of things that somehow, in my opinion, explain more than, uh, than, a, lot of, uh, than, than a lot of other things. You know? Interaction, the ability to coagulate you know, critical mass at the right moment, and um, roaming around freely, and the people let you do it. And, uh, and that's the, the great um, trick of ad advising. Those of you who are going to become a great advisor, hands on, hands off. Hands on, hands off, OK? Because people need freedom. All right, so I think uh, I got to the end of my questions, so we need some questions from the audience. And I'll try and repeat them. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so apparently when the results came out, there was a huge negative pushback on it, and uh, how did that affect you, and when did you, when, how did the community uh, change its mind? Is that kind of a question? So, both of you. So I guess I guess one of the lucky things for us was that, uh, for example, that first paper on semantic encryption, uh, semantic security did get in the probabilistic encryption paper right away, and so we also had some other successes of that sort. Uh, so the paper that really did not get accepted was this paper on zero knowledge, which actually has gotten a lot more uh, publicity than the ones that did eventually. So I think the f the fact that we did have these original successes uh, gave us the confidence. That they, we know, we know it's good. We know it's going to get in, and we know and get in in the sense people are going to understand it. It's just time to get it to get a better and better solution, a cleaner definition, a better exposition. I do see, and Silva may think differently, but I do see these days. You know, I mean, I've had lots and lots of graduate students, and I do know that in the beginning, you know, if you have a if you have a lot of failures in the beginning, it's extremely discouraging, extremely discouraging for ex people who are. You know, humongously talented. Even though, even if they succeed later, that original. Uh, a sequence of failures, that it's, it's not good. Uh, often I've seen people decide that they're going to leave academia because this is just too unpleasant and too hard, even if they succeeded eventually. And I actually think it's something that this community should pay attention to. A, I mean, I know you, you can't go to a conference and say, you know, these are early papers of students, don't discourage them. Uh, I understand you can't do it that simply, but there has to be some other mechanism because it's unfortunate. But you know, you, to get rejected and, li and, and, and get through it, you have to have some resilience. And where, why would you believe that it's going to be okay. Well, I think some conference, I, I don't know the theory community, but I, I've gotten to know the machine learning community. And they have poster sessions. As you can get, you get like four different levels of acceptance. And the bottom most one is you get to do a poster, right? A short poster, I think. And so they're able to get more people involved. But that, that might be an example of ways to involve things. How about, what do you, about the controversy and acceptance? So um, controversy is, is always a good sign. If there is not enough controversy, how impactful can you be and how much uh, paradigm shifting can it be? So I think uh, you should expect some controversy. However, you should stick to your guns. And if you think if the work is good, then it is good. And as I'm, let me tell you, so um, Dave uh, and Shafi and I are in this business, like you know, the rest of the faculty here, because we are close to the young people. And, uh, you know, uh, right? So what is good about the good people? They have the best knows that there is. So I think is that if you believe it, most probably you're right. 
and is actually, we have a generation on Gary, okay? So um, just uh, be uh, believing yourself. That, that is um, somehow. And be, besides, whatever you know, uh, doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, um, and so, I mean, rejection never killed anybody. So then uh, don't take it uh, no, too seriously and uh, persevere. And um, by the way, we, however, did uh, a few strategic uh, things. So we decided that perhaps to give talks would have been a good idea. So we spend a lot of time. So you can't, as grad students, you decide to go around and give talks? Yes. And to give talks, and you know, say, hi, hey, I just happened to be by. <laughs> so anyway, I have to be driving by. I said, driving by. <laughs> and I give talks and tell, because people, when they can interact with you and hear the idea and the raw thing, and, and you know, then you have to be receptive. What do they didn't understand? How can I change it to make it more, more understandable? So there are other, other things that, uh, that you could do. But by the way, so um, um, a vibrant scientific community needs a good structure of conferences. Because at the end of the community, the glue to keep a scientific community together are really the right conferences. And I, I believe that you know, this uh, ITCS, you may not know it, but uh, Innovation in Theoretical Computer Science was actually invented to allow room for uh, papers that otherwise would not get in, that were actually novel and, and whimsical. And so um, if you don't have the equivalent uh, in your own field, um, introduce <laughs> such conferences because we we need uh, this um, uh, um, this type of contribution yeah great uh, another we do a few more questions they're not going to kick us out of the room for a while okay go ahead um so i noticed that both of you um had a slightly different education than you would expect like you had a classical education and you were really interested in literature and so on do you feel like that influenced the kind of work that you did, or how did that influence the work that you did? So the, yeah, the question is, uh, you didn't have a strict science undergraduate. You had, they were interested in literature and classical training. Do you think that uh, shaped how you do research? Absolutely, yes. So by the way, you do research with whatever you are, okay? So uh, there is no r reason. So, so you bring to the endeavor your own personal history a period, and everyone is very good that has a, a very different personal history. So I really believe that, you know, my, uh, there are different ways of doing research, and, and I pref my preference is this for that magmatic stage when things are not fixed, when the problem is really ill-defined, when there is, you know, lava not, not, quite, not taking any shape yet, right? And so, you know, before science there was philosophy, because people always asked questions, but they didn't have the tools to, to, to ask them, but they had the mental framework in which to put these tools. And I was exposed to a lot of these mental framework and where you put things. And um, tell you the truth, you know, I happen to run with it, because uh, very often, you know, to, to try to contribute to some uh, mental framework in which we could put these results and start talking about a theory rather than a theorem. And, um, but uh, again, that is, um, that is, in my case, is not the only way you should find your way. Okay, other questions? Yes? Uh, so what advice would you give to a student just getting started in theoretical computer science? Okay, what advice would you give a first year students in theory? Um, well, <laughs> my advice is really to, um, to uh, take some classes and uh, see something that appeals to you. And, and when I say see something that appeals to you, it's using all your senses, both your sort of uh, you know, critical sense of sort of an analytical and whether it seems uh, sound, but also taste. Taste, uh, something that compels you. And uh, the reason I'm saying to take classes, or you know, the Simons Institute exists here, there's semesters that are devoted to topics, in some sense it's like taking a class. If you go to the boot camp, you go to the lectures, you go to seminars, that could be an equivalent of a class. You don't do homework, but if you listen, uh, and somebody is a good speaker, it's very important that they would be a good speaker. A good speaker to you, I mean a good speaker is something that's kind of personalized, right? Somebody that appeals to you is not necessarily someone who appeals to someone else. But if there's some talk that appeals to you and you go back to the paper and you read it and there's, you understand what it is, what's the question, what are the new, what, is, what are some further questions you, you could ask that you might be interested in solving. Uh, so in my mind, uh, it's not so much doing the homework but it's being exposed. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, following my own history, I would actually be more interested in, in, in fields which are either on the cusp of change or they're just beginning. Uh, because especially as a graduate student, it would be better uh, use of your time to go in a field like that. And often that's where the kind of more open-ended questions exist. You know, eventually you're already trenched in a field, you're working maybe on the hard problem, on the technical problem. I would not do that as a beginning graduate student. But, you know, there is some subset of the graduate students who, who, that's perfect for them. That would not be my general advice. Yeah. Any advice? Mm, I'm afraid that I'm uh, to agree with... Uh, yeah, oh, she has to uh, <laughs> have to agree with Shafi. All right. Uh, uh, two more questions. More questions. Yeah. Um, so they say that uh, the more you know, the less you think you know. And I was wondering if you had any experiences where uh, you felt like the research field was so vast and so big compared to what you at that time and um, I guess for me I've experienced times where I feel like I'm just kind of groping around in the dark and not sure where to go and I was wondering if you guys have any advice on or if, as well as personal experiences on how you um, like were able to overcome that period of uncertainty. So maybe uh, the question is when you getting started uh, the field can seem so vast that you don't know how to navigate and did you ever feel that way and do you have any advice? Uh, well, first of all, welcome to the game. So the notion <laughs> of feeling lost is natural. So there is nothing wrong about you if you don't feel lost, okay? So that is um, a part of the thing. And um, um, I'm, um, I've always, um, 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 you know, there is not a universal advice right here. I already told you that I prefer uh, something with unstructured. People may feel that it's easier because there are f fewer things to know. It is also true. Say, so wh which direction do I go? Right. So it's, uh, it, it cuts both ways. To me, when things become so complicated, I change fields. And so somehow, I'm, uh, whenever I cannot even read them, the paper in, uh, in whatever I was working just uh, a few years ago, I think that I should <laughs> move on. So, uh, but, but I think, you know, never mind what your, your state is, I think is that, first of all, internalize that feeling lost is really step one of getting somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I completely, I have to agree with Silvio. There, there's actually, there's some, I have a friend at Weizmann that has a whole TED talk about this, about, and he, he describes it as being in the cloud. And, uh, you know, these periods of finding his research, uh, uh, his, his PhD thesis, then his uh, original results as a, an assistant professor, is having a long period of having the flu. Um, a really long, the flu. The flu. <laughs> it's like, it's incredibly depressing and, 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 and lost, and, you know, you don't understand things. And then somehow some, you know, you actually get an understanding, you maybe prove a result if you're talking about theory of computing, uh, you have an idea, and all of a sudden, you know, the, or being in a cloud, you know, sun comes out. So this is a natural phase. I almost think you can't do it without it. So if you haven't had that period, actually something might be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so th that's my feeling. Uh, but another thing about having a vast, it, everybody, there's so much to know and you don't know it, I don't believe it. The truth is I don't believe it. I, I think that you know when you have really great speakers who really understand what they've done and they understand the field and they tell you something novel, I don't ever believe it that you need tons and tons and tons of background to understand what's important, what the results are. I almost feel, I mean, I, I, I ask forgiveness for those who disagree with me, but I almost feel that mathematicians have, you know, they introduce all this structure and all this notation and all these words for some reason is unclear to me because <laughs> at the end, okay, there's something there that can be explained without all that. That's always been my feeling. And it might be because of my lack of ability, but I uh, suspect that's not the case. So it's, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's the importance of great teachers, right? People who Absolutely. can, you know. Uh, Absolutely. You, so you want to be at a place that has <laughs> great researchers Absolutely. And, and people who can teach. And I think that Manuel Blum, for example, was our advisor and also Umesh, I think he was a great teacher yeah. in his own unique way. I mean, you look at the kind of notes that he wrote to himself, it's like you can't understand where the page begins and ends. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily organized, but he was a great communicator. Yeah, this, uh, because I retired two years ago, I had time to reflect, and uh, there's a picture of five people who won the Distinguished Teaching Award on this campus. And the five people are Randy Katz, John Osterhout, uh, me, Dick Karp, and Manuel Blum. 
So three of them won Turing Awards. <laughs> all of them are in the National Academy of Engineering, all of them very successful. So kind of this idea that people who are great researchers can't teach, I think it's because students, when they get a terrible teacher, they think they must be great at research. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> because what else are they doing here? I, 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 I think, I, I think that the, you know, they're, those are, they're correlated, right? They're it, apparently they're also great uh, interviewers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, I think with that, we're going to declare victory, and we'll, we'll do this again for the next six weeks. But thanks very much for flying all the way out here, and have a good day. That was great. That was great. <laughs> <laughs>